For more than 20 years, I've been obsessed with guitars. From playing them, to working on them, to buying and collecting them, I've built quite the collection of awesome custom guitars. This season, I'll be rebuilding guitars sent in by fans of the show. I'll be rebuilding 14 guitars over 14 weeks, each with a unique and interesting backstory. I'll be refinishing, refretting, rewiring, whatever it takes to make these things into the guitars of their dreams. This is Trash to Thrash. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Trash to Thrash. I'm your host, Mark Murray. And today, we're gonna to be taking a look back at the first half of season two of Trash to Thrash. It's been six episodes so far, nine guitars, and I've got a lot of questions and comments about the first half of season two so far that I thought I was gonna go back and address some of the things you guys have been asking me about and commenting on. We're gonna be going back over the Hetfield Rusty, the Alexi Lihau Jackson Rhodes, the two Arbor Flying Vs that I built, the Circles EVH guitar, the Frankenstrat from that episode, the 78 Eruption, the PV Rockmaster, and the Crackle Kelly. So let's start back at the beginning with the Hetfield Rusty. This is the James Hetfield Rusty replica that we built for episode one of season two. It's basically a clone of James Hetfield's Rusty made from a Gibson Explorer. This is how the guitar started. It was a gothic Gibson Explorer that I picked up used and transformed into the James Hetfield Rusty, like shown here. If you missed this episode, there's a link to it down in the description below. With the Hetfield Rusty replica I built, there was a lot of things that stood out to you guys during that build. First off, I want to say there was a ton of positive comments. I read them all, I saw them all, so thank you to everybody who left one of those. But there was some people who were critical of some of the things I did on this one, starting with the pick guard. Some people didn't like the style of rust that I achieved with this pick guard, and I really liked it, my customer liked it, and to me, that's really all that matters. But in the future, I might explore other ways to rust things. Um, I saw people in the comments left some alternate ways to do it, which one day I may test out. Another thing that people were asking about was the battery placement. I had placed the battery under the pick guard where there was an empty cavity that used to house the pickup selector switch, but since it was empty, it was a perfect spot to put a battery. People were saying that you have to remove the pick guard and that's too much work to replace the battery. First of all, it's, it's eight screws. So if you have an electric screwdriver, it takes you less than a minute. And really, how often are you replacing the battery in an active pickup guitar? It says it should last 3,000 hours. If you have two pickups, that's 1,500 hours. I really can't see you needing to replace the battery more than once a year. But even if that's the case, once a year, when you're doing your regular guitar maintenance, changing the strings and oiling the neck, you know, if it only takes you another minute or two to pop the pick guard off and change the battery, it really isn't that much more time to put into working on your guitar. I saw some other questions about fitting 9 volt batteries in the original control cavity location. For some people who have other explorers and don't have that option of mounting it up in the wing section, somebody else chimed in and said, yeah, you can totally fit a battery down in that control cavity. And another guy with the Gothic Explorer said that the thin sliver going up to the selector switch cavity can easily house two 9 volt batteries. So if you want to do the 18 volt mod, that's an option. The next thing that was brought up a lot in the comments was the truss rod cover. Some people said I should have made a rusty one. Some people said I should have made a blank one that doesn't say Epiphone. Um, it's really up to my customer. In this case, we we're building a replica of James Hetfield's Rusty. And while I do agree, a rusty one would have looked awesome if it matched the pick guard. That's not the way James Hetfield's guitar is. His just has a stock Gibson style truss rod cover. So that's what we went with for this guitar. The other big thing that I saw that was brought up a lot with this guitar was replacing the headstock logo. It's an Epiphone Explorer and James' guitar is a Gibson. We didn't put any logo on the headstock. We left the truss rod cover that says Epiphone, but in my opinion and my customers, a blank Explorer headstock looks super good, especially in a matte black finish. It looked really good, so there was no need to put a headstock logo on this one. Like I said, it says it right on the truss rod. I also got a comment that I should have put the Guitar Guts logo up there on the headstock, but you know, I can see why my customer wouldn't want that. Again, it's a replica guitar, so you want it to look like the original as much as possible without putting the Gibson, you know, a fake logo up on the headstock. During this episode, I did a poll and asked you guys to comment down below and let me know what your favorite Metallica album was. Well, it was a tie between Master of Puppets and Injustice for All. Both received 15 votes. Ride the Lightning got 11 comments, while Kill 'Em All and the Black Album both received four. After that, there was a drop off with some albums receiving one or zero votes. At the end of the episode, I did a playthrough with the guitar and jammed out some riffs on it, and I saw some funny comments. Somebody commented that I had said, Hetfield wrote some of the best riffs in heavy metal, and then I played Ander Sandman. 
which if you don't know, that's a riff written by Kirk Hammett. Another person said with an EMG 81, you don't need a sound demo. People literally attach them to shovels and it still sounds like an 81. It's 100% true. Another person wrote, makes a guitar from the Saint Anger era, plays Enter Sandman on it. Should be playing Frantic on it, another person wrote. Look, I said in the episode, I'm not really a Saint Anger fan, and at this point, I'm not gonna go sit down and learn a bunch of riffs to songs I really don't love, so... It was Enter Sandman, and it was Master of Puppets on this one. Five minutes and 28 seconds of bullcrap. When does the video start? Pass. This comment here was about the contests, and um, saying that I might be going against some of the rules the way I'm giving guitars away in my Patreon giveaways and all that stuff. I do offer no purchase necessary ways on all of my giveaways. So you have to follow me on Instagram at Guitar Guts. If you want to get in on the free entry without having to be a member of the Patreon page, I do let a certain amount of people in to the guitar giveaways too. And I'm going to be opening it up eventually even more. So I do offer no purchase necessary ways on all my contests. Marty said at 827, that's not a die grinder, dumbass. It's an angle grinder with a zip disc. Sorry, man, I don't know the difference between the two. I actually wasn't the one using the tool in this video. I bet Marty's a ton of fun at parties. Patrick said, the Epiphone EX is much more rounded than the Gibson or ESP version. If you want the real Hetfield Explorer, you need to reshape the guitar. That's a crazy detail, Patrick. That would have been a lot more work to do, but also this is an Epiphone Gothic, not an Epiphone EX. So I'm pretty sure that the Gothics have the same shape as the Gibson ones that they're copying. Somebody wrote, I thought you built and made everything yourself. Bummer. On to another video. See you later, man. If I were to build everything from scratch like that, it would have cost more than double what I charge my customer. I'll say this, this guitar cost under a thousand bucks and for an artist replica like that, I mean, that's a crazy good deal. So if I were to make it by hand and do it all myself, make a brand new body neck, fret it, you know, put a fretboard on it, all that stuff. I mean, that's going to be 2000 plus dollars. So I think it's fun to restore guitars, give them new life, take them from, you know, an old beat up guitar, turn them into something killer. And that's what I did here. I turned a used guitar into something really awesome. In my opinion, another comment said, cool videos, man. Wish there was someone over here in the UK that would do custom and left-handed. Hey, I, I actually do. I ship all over the world. So the UK, no problem. Send me an email, mark at guitarguts.com. Another person asks, are these done for free or is there money involved? There's money involved, so it's just like any other guitar shop. If you send me an email, I can write you a quote, let you know how much it's going to cost. But yeah, um, as the comment down below it, somebody kind of answered for me. So much time goes into these things and the, the money for the parts and my helper. So yeah, that, I charge for all the work. Somebody asked, why not just remake the body? Again, keeping costs low and taking old guitars and just giving them new life, recycling them. Another person wrote, that's really cool. Two things though, why not route out a battery box on the back? You, I could have done that, but like I said, I was trying to keep the cost low for my customer. He had a certain budget he wanted to keep this under and adding a battery box in parts plus labor is not cheap. It's actually quite a bit of work to put in a battery box. I was also asked, hey, do you think you can make a dime bag ML like this one? Absolutely, with the rust and the flat black and all the detail like that, definitely. I got another one here that says, so the only way to win a guitar from you is to agree to join the top level Patreon of your channel. Looks more like you're just wanting people's money. I mean, I am building these for a business and I can't be just giving guitars away. At this point, if I were to sell these guitars, I would make way more than I am off the Patreon. So if people want to help support the channel, if they want a chance to win something, that's really what the Patreon's for. But yeah, these are expensive guitars. They're nice guitars. And if people want to help donate to the channel, and get something in return, then it's a great symbiotic relationship. Another comment here says, okay, James is one of your favorite guitarists. If Dime isn't one of your favorites, then I'm done. I love Dimebag Daryl, so uh, I guess you're not done over here, okay? I'll probably be doing some type of Dimebag builds coming up in the future. If you've been watching the backgrounds of some of my videos, you've seen some Deans floating around. I also got a lot of really nice comments just in general about season two coming back. Season two is off to a great start. It was definitely worth the wait. I'm so glad we could finally see a guitar start to finish in a single episode. I really hope the rest will be like this too. It's so satisfying. I'm gonna try to keep that up. I think we're gonna be doing that on every episode. Um, it says the man is back. Hell yeah, I've been waiting for season two. It's such a cool guitar. I'm so excited for this season. Kicked off season two with a bang. Awesome episode, love the changes and amazing build. Thank God Trash to Thrash is back. The Rusty is raging. So I appreciate that. Thanks so much guys for your nice comments on this one. Now let's get on to episode two about the Alexi Laiho Jackson Rhodes. 
This is the Alexi Laiho Jackson Rhodes that we built for our customer Marcel. Go check out episode 2 of season 2 if you missed this one, link down in the description below. We built a replica of Alexi's Wild Child using a Jackson RRXMG. This is what the guitar looked like when it arrived to the shop, before we filled in the neck pickup and repainted it, and this is what it looked like when we were done with it. This one is definitely one of the season 2 fan favorites so far. I got a bunch of really nice comments and compliments about this guitar. I appreciate that, thank you guys so much. But I got a lot of other comments too. For the Alexi Laiho episode, a lot of people came on, said RIP Alexi, gave their condolences, and you know, we just lost him in the last year, so a lot of people are still feeling this one. Another one of the big things everybody was talking about in this episode was I was asking about tape bleed. If you guys have experience painting guitars and when I painted the bevels of this guitar and taped them off, I was getting some tape bleed. A lot of people said that I should go back and repaint the first color after I do my tape. So it's gonna seal all those small gaps with the first color. And then when I paint the next coats on there, it's already gonna have those small gaps filled and I won't get tape bleed. Pretty genius little trick there, except if I'm doing a Frankenstrat or something that's like three colors, what do you do then? Well, somebody else came on and said, seal that edge in with clear coat instead. So you do your two colors, put your tape on, throw a coat of clear, and now all those gaps are filled with clear. Now throw your third color on and you won't get tape bleeding anymore. There was also a lot of different tape suggestions, so I may be doing some experiments in the future to see which ones are the best. Another thing a ton of people were talking about was darkening the fretboard. I guess a lot of people don't like rosewood fretboards. I happen to like rosewood fretboards, but everybody's all about ebony these days. So they're saying darken those fretboards on those Jacksons that you build and it's gonna make them way nicer. I have been experimenting with darkening fretboards. So in the future, you're gonna be seeing this, but I didn't do it on this guitar. One of the things that was really fun was reading your guys' answer when I asked you, what do you guys play to impress people? In that episode, Alexi said he played Metallica's One. I said I played that all the time to impress people in Eruption. But a lot of people were saying, you know, they play Children of Bodom. They played a bastardized version of One. I like playing Three of a Perfect Pair by King Crimson. It doesn't impress the wife, though. She just tells me that I'm weird and no one likes my music. And she's not wrong. I disagree with that. I like King Crimson and Three of a Perfect Pair, by the way. Someone said Tornado and Painkiller are pretty impressive, so I play those. I agree with that. Daniel wrote, to impress the ladies, I used to play Blackbird or Slow Dancing in the Burning Room because not that many people in my circle knew about Metallica and Children of Bodom and Dream Theater. I play Smoke on the Water to impress people. That's awesome. I played the One Solo, Sanitarium, and Eruption. Eddie and Kirk got me all kinds of ass. Haha, <laughs> sick build, Mark. This season is shaping up to be killer. Love what you're doing. Rock on. I play House of the Rising Sun, but so far have failed to impress anyone. <laughs> Alright, so I got a lot of general comments on this episode, and the first one was, thought there would be at least a tiny piece of a Children of Bodom solo or song, instead the video felt more like an homage to Metallica, rest in peace Alexi. I totally get it, man. If I knew how to play any Children of Bodom, you know I would have definitely rocked it out for you guys, but the pace that I'm putting these episodes out, building guitars all day long, and then editing the episodes all day long, I didn't have time to learn any of his songs and I don't really know him, any of them yet. So for me to have learned one, I would have needed a couple extra days and I just didn't have the time. One person asked, I don't understand why you got rid of the double pickup and switched to a single. Isn't the double pickup more of a rich sound, especially when playing metal riffs and shredding solos? For this guitar, the reason we went away from having two pickups is because it's a replica. It's a copy of an artist's guitar, Alexi Laiho's Wild Child guitar. So it only had one pickup and my customer wanted the exact same guitar pretty much. So we modified a couple things here or there, but for the most part, we copied the guitar dead on. Alexi uses one pickup, so Marcel uses one pickup. Nate said, I thought the bevels were gold flake on the original Wild Child. The Jackson? I haven't heard that. If you guys know anything about that, let me know in the comments below. Somebody, somebody wrote, wait, WTF? You just scuffed the original paint? LOFL, ghetto dude, ghetto. This is definitely not ghetto. Anytime you repaint anything, you rarely take it back down to the original material that it was. When you repaint your car, you don't take it back down to metal. When you repaint a guitar, you don't take it back down to wood. The paint that's on there, as long as you sand it well, you're gonna create a mechanical bond when you put new paint over it. So you're gonna need to scuff up the surface with something good, like, you know, 600 grit sandpaper or something. Not just scuff it up, but you really definitely wanna sand it well with some 600 grit or similar sandpaper. Definitely not ghetto, the right way to do it. Another person said, if I was going to add a D-tuna, I would have routed around where the D-tuna is in the cavity so I could pull the bar up, too. Schechter routes it like that with models that come with a D-tuna. 
You know, the one thing about a detune it is you're supposed to block the bridge because it's not supposed to pull back anymore. It's supposed to stay stabilized unless you add a stabilizer. Maybe that's what Schechter's doing for that. The reason we didn't add any cutout around the detune it is because Marcel, the buyer, um, he agreed that we're just going to block the tremolo. It, we're not going to be pulling the bar up anyways. It makes the detune way more stable when you block the tremolo. When I say blocking the tremolo, of course, I mean stopping it from pulling back from the bar pulling up. Um, it'll still go down in the dive mode. The owner of this guitar even commented, Hey guys, future owner of the guitar here. Just wanted to say that I'm incredibly happy with what Mark has done by building me this absolute dream guitar. Alexi was my personal guitar hero and what and who got me interested in, in lead guitar in the first place, even though I'm usually a strict rhythm player. So naturally, I was absolutely devastated by the news of his death and wanted to honor him and his legacy as much as possible. Got in contact with Mark in early slash mid-February and once we figured out exactly what I wanted and what bass guitar we needed to turn the vision into reality, the project started. Customer communication was a breeze and Mark was always very open to suggestions down the line, even keeping up with all the nitty gritty details I kept pestering him with down the line. Sorry, no problem Marcel. All in all, I'm super thankful and I can't recommend Mark's services enough. No matter whether you're looking for something basic or something more extravagant, he will find a way to pull it off for you. Thank you, Marcel. Episodes 23 and 24 feature these two Arbor Flying Vs. This is John's Arbor Piranha Flying V. When it came to the shop, this is how it looked. I refinished the guitar for John and he reassembled it, and this is the finished product. This is how Alex's Arbor arrived to us, and we converted it into this super hot shred beast. Once again, I got a lot of really nice comments from you guys about these Arbor guitars, so thank you all for the great compliments. Anytime you guys leave comments and hit that like button, it helps the channel grow and it helps YouTube to know that people are liking this video and bumps us up in the algorithm so more people are suggested this video. By the way, be sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to be notified every time a new video drops. For the Arbor Guitars, I reached out to you guys to find out if you guys knew more about the company. There's really not a lot of information out there about Arbor Guitars. And on that episode, I got a couple of people who gave me some good information. The Arbor story is similar to Hondo, JB Player, and so many more brands of that time. Distributor brands. Arbor was a brand name used by Music Corp. The distributors would go to Fujigen, Samic, Court, etc. and have them put a meaningless brand name on musical products. They had a bunch of brands in their catalog, and their primary market was smaller music stores, places that might not be able to get big brands like Fender, Gibson, or even PV. Maybe they were in a market that was protected by a brand for another dealer, but they may have been a record store, a department store, or even a franchised Radio Shack. A couple people agreed with that, and it seems to be that's what they were doing. I had also questioned if Alex's headstock was the original one, since I had never seen another one of those Piranha Flying Vs with that headstock. But here, somebody said Arbor on some of the really early RR models had that Explorer headstock. My dad has that on his. So, if we're seeing multiples like that, I'm not surprised that it was a regular thing. The binding on the guitar was another point of conversation. The orange binding is so cool, never too much orange on a guitar and never too many orange guitars. But also somebody said, the painted binding and side dot stickers are whack dude, huge no no. That will wear off in no time. Great job on everything else but you shouldn't have taken a shortcut there. I don't think this is a shortcut, this is the same way that I put my logos on my headstocks and my guitars. Put the logo on, spray some clear coat over it and seal it in. I did the same thing on the side markers and there's a ton of companies out there who paint clear coat over their binding, so I don't see what the difference is here. In this episode, I asked people, what was your favorite guitar so far on Trash to Thrash season one or two that I've built? And I got a lot of different responses from that. That was pretty cool to read your guys' responses. Some people were saying Alien Blood. Some people were saying this was the best one, the Orange Arbor. Some people like the Stealth Splatter Kelly. And other people like the Crackle guitars. To repair the headstock on this guitar, I got a lot of criticism on the way that I did it using metal dowels. People said wooden dowels would have been a better choice than metal, that the glue that I used isn't going to stick to the metal. My only thing I can really say back to that is that metal was basically pressed into the headstock. There was five dowels going through and it wasn't an easy fit getting them through. So. Just spatially, I don't think they're going to come out. Another thing is I think that glue is going to hold them. Maybe it's not going to hold as well as it would against wood, but I think in this case, when it's crammed in there, I don't think that thing's going anywhere. Furthermore, I think the amount of glue that I initially used to glue the neck and the headstock back together probably would have held. I mean, I completely covered it, but to be safe, of course, I put in the dowels. I know these dowels aren't going to break, and I don't think they're going to be slipping out. They're not going to be coming out the side, so... 
In the future, I probably will change to wooden dowels because with the wood glue, it probably is going to bond all together a little better. But I don't think this thing is at risk of breaking again unless it suffers another serious fall. Any guitar would be susceptible to that. I also got a few comments about fixing Alex's headstock for free. Maybe some luthiers would have sent it back or tried to charge him, but I try to take care of my customers. If there's little things I can do for free or little things I can throw in or something big like that that I can fix that's not really going to cost me anything other than time, of course I'm going to do it. I want to take care of my customers and I want them to be super happy and come back, tell their friends, spread the word, so happy to do it. I also got a few comments from you guys commenting that I did not jam a song out for you on the Arbors. I apologize for that. I'm going to try to do that in the future as much as possible. Check out the link down below. I have a link to my Spotify page and you can hear some of my original music on there. The owner of this guitar actually wrote in some comments himself. Someone told him, way to go Alex, keeping it for that long and keeping it orange because Alex owned this thing since the early 80s. Alex said, thank you man, the guitar got sold five times. The fifth time, it was bought by the first original buyer I sold it to. Then I bought it back for $25. It sat at my house for about 12 years until seven months ago when I sent it to Mark. He continued on, thank you Mark, I love it. It looks killer, badass, I can't wait to play it. The guitar still has that early 80s vintage look when it did when my dad first got it for me back in 1983. I think you did a fantastic job. Thanks again, Alex. So I misspoke in this episode about radius. Radius is measured in inches, not degrees. I misspoke, said it's measured in degrees, and I got quite a few people correcting me on that. I got a lot of other questions on this guitar. One of them was, why would you not do a 25 and a half inch scale if you're loosening string tension, especially at a lower tuning? All right, well, for this guitar, it already has a neck. And if you want to know your scale length, you measure from your nut to your 12th fret, and that's half your scale length. You double that number, and that's going to give you your scale length. This guitar had the neck. It's a set neck. You've got to kind of go by that because the frets are spaced a certain way that it's going to match a certain scale length. You can't change it without changing the fret distance. The fret spacing on this guitar was set up for 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length, so I couldn't have changed it to 25 and a half unless I took the whole fretboard off put a brand new one on with the proper spacing for 25 and a half, and then relocated the bridge. Somebody asked if I do bass stuff. Absolutely. My contact information is down below. Send me an email. Somebody said, could have moved the output jack to the other horn. Makes it more comfortable to play. I agree, but you know, I have a budget that I'm working with my customers, so I can't just go all out with every single build. I mean, this one we went pretty crazy with already. But to relocate that to the other horn would be a huge amount of work. There's no control cavities anywhere near that area. So it would have taken quite a bit of modification to even do that. Somebody commented, Alex's Piranha. Before, maybe 150 bucks. After, priceless. Somebody asked, wondering why you didn't route the top of the body so the Floyd could have full movement. The reason is because this body, the neck was angled up. So the bridge sits higher naturally and it would have been actually sitting above the body. It would have looked kind of weird to have it recessed because it would have been sitting higher than the body when you recess it. You want to re-angle the neck so it sits straight across and then the Floyd needs to sit lower. So for this guitar, since the neck was at that angle, like I said, it's a set neck or a neck through, um, it would be pretty difficult to try to re-angle that neck. Somebody commented on the top mount Floyd. Love the old school top mount Floyd. They play way better and they are full movement despite all the comments saying they're not. They have a four degree neck angle like a Les Paul, so it sits higher. This is by far my favorite episode in guitar. Someone wrote, I feel that giving a guitar with a Kaler trim, a Floyd Rose is kind of a sin and the other way around. But when the result is this good, it's okay. The guitar's headstock was broken in transit due to the shipping company. A lot of people wrote in about that, including some people saying ship a guitar in a case every time. And some people said even a gig bag is fine. Some people, and I agree with it, even said a hard shell case isn't always the best if it's not made for the guitar, which is correct. I've had guitars shipped in the improper cases where they're moving around and the tip of the, the headstock breaks off. And even with gig bags, I've had them sliding around inside the gig bag if it's not fitted properly to the guitar and hit the inside of the zipper. And there's actually a little paint chip in there. In episode six of season two, I worked on three different Van Halen style guitars. I turned Greg and Dom's Wolfgang into the Circles Wolfgang. I turned Jim Vogel's Fender Strat into this Frankenstrat. And I painted the headstock for this 78 Wolfgang for Jean Franco. During the EVH episode, I asked you guys, what's your favorite EVH guitar? And the answers were all over the board. I thought the 5150 and the Frankenstrat were gonna dominate, but a lot of people said the Bumblebee, the Shark, 
A lot of people said circles, which I wonder if they were influenced by this video or if the whole time there's all these people who love circles guitars. I also said in this episode that EVH has the coolest original artwork on his guitars. Kirk Hammett has super awesome guitars, but I don't believe any of those are his original artwork. But you guys let me know about George Lynch and Steve Vai, which of course, they have awesome guitars, so I agree, they're right up there too. Somebody asked in the comments section if it's a requirement that every guitar gets a kill switch. Somebody else answered for me, yes. And the answer is, yes, it's a requirement. I also saw a couple people pointing out that the USA body was actually a made in Mexico body. There's a couple key things that you can tell. I don't really know, I'm not an expert on that, but if you guys notice that, let me know in the comments. Is, you, is this really a made in Mexico body or is it a USA body? Somebody else commented, not an EVH fan at all, but I hope you charge triple for this rather one-off verse than them buying a reissue. Seems a lot of work for a very minuscule slash one-off bragging right. I charge about the same that I normally would for any type of high gloss, crackle, multicolor job. I wanted to do this job too. I was up to the challenge. I'd never done a circles and now I have some new skills from doing this guitar. I got paid well from it, so I'm happy with it. And I think my customer is gonna be really happy with it as well. When you have a custom guitar shop, one thing that you always wanna keep in mind is keeping your customers happy so that they'll come back or refer you. If you blow them out of the water with your builds, they're gonna definitely come back. And that's what I wanna do with this Circles guitar. I was also asked in the comments section, how do you run the wire from the newly drilled hole to the control cavity? What I use is this really long drill bit. So this is about a 14 inch long drill bit or so. It's 3 16 of an inch, so you can run multiple wires through it. And you just get back and drill all the way through. But you really gotta watch what you're doing because it's a lot easier to drill through the side or the front of the guitar when you're using this long of a bit. Sean asked, Hey, can you tell how you're getting that tone in the background? What pickup and what amp? Throughout the whole episode, I'm jamming some Van Halen tunes, and I'm actually using a Lundgren pickup. It's a Heaven 77, one of my favorite pickups, and I'm using an Axe FX. So that's like a computer processor for a guitar, and I have a bunch of presets that I started with on there that I've modified since then. So, so all the Van Halen tones that you're hearing, I've kind of modified from the Axe FX. Jim Vogel, the owner of the Frankenstrat, commented, Oh my god, it's beyond killer. All these guitars are awesome. They all sound amazing. I'm honored to have a Guitar Guts modded axe. I'll play it with pride, brother. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, James. There are a ton of really nice comments, so thank you guys for all the compliments on these guitars. I couldn't put them all up, but here's a small sample of them. Episode 6 of Season 2 featured the PV Rockmaster and the Crackle Jackson Kelly. This is what the PV Rockmaster looked like when it showed up at the shop, and this is what it looked like on its way out. And this is what the Kelly looked like when we started. And this is what it looked like when we were finished with it. All right, the PV Rockmaster and the Crackle Kelly. You guys seem to love these two guitars. I got a lot of comments about the Crackle Kelly. I got a ton of comments about the PV Rockmaster. And one of the things that kept coming up was the Crackle pattern. People liked it. But a lot of people were wondering, how do you achieve a bigger crackle pattern? And that's something I'm still trying to figure out myself. If you have experience painting crackle and you want to shed some light on this for us, leave a comment down below, let us know. I've heard a few different ways and I'm going to be doing some experiments coming up in the next couple weeks to try to figure it out because I have a couple clients who want larger crackle patterns and one way or another, I got to figure it out. A criticism I got on this guitar was that the Goto bridge didn't fit the cavity of the old floating bridge perfectly. And at first when I set it in there for a dry fit, I didn't really notice it. It didn't catch my eye, I should say. But after putting it in, I have noticed that. I don't love that. And this is one of the giveaway guitars. If the person who buys this guitar wants me to paint that cavity black, that's something I thought about taking the guitar back apart, painting the cavity black and throwing it back together. But at this point, it's not that bad. Um, I don't know. If the person wants me to paint it black, I'd gladly do it. But it's getting left like that. I got some great feedback on my original song and my playing, so I appreciate that from you guys. And in this episode, I had a ton of random questions and comments. This comment here was a good one. It was saying that maybe I should make a sleeve to go around the 9-volt batteries when I'm using clear pick guards because I custom paint the battery, but when the battery dies, they have to throw like a regular Duracell or Energizer battery in there, and it doesn't look quite as good as the custom painted one. So maybe if I made like a sleeve that can slip over the battery, that's something I'm definitely going to consider. Another idea I've had is using rechargeable 9 volts. Give the people two of them so they can swap them back and forth. 
and maybe add 15 bucks into the cost of the guitar, but include a 9-volt charger and give that to them too. What do you guys think? Would you pay 15 bucks extra for an extra 9-volt battery and a charger? I've also seen some Fishman systems use a USB plug and you just plug it into the guitar and it recharges. Another comment somebody wrote, great video as usual. I don't think that Kelly is a 96 though. Those 96 and 97 Japanese serial numbers weren't dated. They were from around the 2000s. Could be possible, I'm not sure. I thought I read the serial number properly, but if you guys know anything more about this, let me know in the comments. Another person wrote, I think you do great work. I do think the kill switch is overused. I don't think every guitar calls for one. To each his own though, keep reviving those guitars. Normally, I would kind of agree with you, although when people come to me for a custom guitar, they're looking for two things. They're looking for cool accessories like kill switches and Floyd Roses, and they're looking for a custom paint job. So most of my guitars are going to have flashy, crazy paint jobs and kill switches because that's what I'm known for. That's why people come to me. But if you look back at the Alexi Laiho episode and the James Hetfield guitar, they don't have kill switches. So no, not every guitar has a kill switch. I was asked, just wondering why you don't sand down and repaint just the face of the guitar when that's all that you messed up. Why repaint the whole thing? That's a great question, and that's because both of these guitars have kind of a specialized finish. The PV Rockmaster had a lot of blues and purples mixed together, so if I were to try to fix just a certain part of it, it was like impossible. I actually did try to uh, fix a couple small spots on it, and they didn't match perfect, and I just said screw it, let's start back over. The Crackle Kelly is kind of the same thing. The crackle pattern kind of weaves in and out, and Sure, I could have tried to repaint just the front, but I figured I think I could do better with the colors, making it look like more of flowy lava, so I just redid it. Another person wrote, guitar collection video would be cool. You always talk about your insane collection. A shot video about it would be great. I'm definitely going to do that. Definitely going to do that. Daniel wrote, yo, I was dead ass going to buy that Superman Wolfgang, and before I could buy it, it was sold. That's right. You guys are competing with me when you're in, out there buying used guitars in the market. And I've actually inspired so many people to go start buying Rhodes and Wolfgangs and Frankenstrats that now I've made it more difficult for myself. I've got way more competition. I see some of these videos of mine have 50,000 plus views. So that means I've got hundreds more people probably out there searching for used guitars. I see you guys always saying, um, does anybody else feel like going and buying used guitars after watching these videos? Well, like I said, now I'm competing with you guys. So if you want that guitar, you better swoop it up quick or I'm gonna. Another person wrote, it's easy to be sponsored by EMG. I mean, there's nothing to exaggerate about. Basically saying that EMGs are so awesome, you don't have to exaggerate. They kind of sell themselves, and I agree with that. By the way, keep watching. Over the next couple weeks, I'm going to be announcing details about the EMG giveaway. I'll be giving away a set of EMG pickups. Me and EMG are going to be teaming up to do this, and I'm super excited about it. I love this one. Somebody wrote, Mark, you coined the term Haxon, but whenever you paint a Jackson with crackle, you don't call it a Craxon. I love that. The Craxon. We got the Haxon. Now we got the Craxon. It's perfect. I got another comment here. Does anyone know what guitar model slash type that light blue teal one is that he's showing the other guy at 42 to 43 seconds? Top kind of looks like an SG, but the rest does not. That's a guitar coming up in a couple weeks here on this show. We're calling it Project Hellspawn, but it's actually a Silver Tone Sovereign. So it's not made to be a metal guitar, and we are going to metal it up. Jesse asked, just curious, how come there isn't a locking nut on the Jackson Kelly? And there actually is a locking nut. It just doesn't have the locking pieces at the top there. I just haven't put them on yet. They're going to go on there. The Crimson Ghosts asked, the Crack Kelly looks great. I just wonder, why do you use the cavity shielding? I always thought active EMG pickups are shielded already. Keep up the great work. They're internally shielded or internally grounded. That is true. But there's still electronic interference that could come in. I mean, it's unlikely, but... It's just good practice to always put shielding inside your guitar. In the past, I had sometimes skipped that step, and then I've kind of made it a habit to just do it all the time in the future. The first time I painted the Kelly, the paint job got some crinkling, and somebody actually commented about that. He said, the crinkle comes from too thick of paint too fast. Let the base coat dry a few days before sanding, steel wool, and clear coat. A really good paint and finish takes weeks. You know, he might be onto something as far as laying too much on at one time, I remember one other time I did see some crinkling, although it was quite a bit different. It was somewhat similar, and it was from painting too thick on when it was too hot out. So I don't know if, if anyone knows about this stuff, you know, and they want to comment on this. Could, do you agree with him? Is that from laying too much paint on too quickly? The same guy commented, Making, building, and refinishing guitars is seriously the most satisfying thing I've ever done in my life. Better than sex. For real, though. 
I disagree. Hey, thanks so much for watching everybody. Let me know if you guys had any reactions or comments to the comments in this video so far. Let me know in the comments below what's your favorite guitar I've built so far in Season 2. Remember, you can find this show at guitarguts.tv. Keep sharing it with your friends and letting people know. I really appreciate that. You can go get the Kill Boost Guitar Guts pedal at guitarguts.com. The Guitar Guts kill switches are over there. And of course, the link to my Patreon is down below in the description. If you want your guitar modded by me, or you want me to build you a custom guitar, check out my email, it's down there in the description below. Send me an email, tell me what kind of guitar you're thinking about, and we'll start brainstorming and figure out what you want. Alright, thanks so much for watching everybody. Be sure to come back next week for an Alien Blood Fender Strat. This thing is going to be insane, super custom, and I know you guys are going to love it. So, have a good week and rock on my friends.